welcome. I'm Tobias and I'll be spending the next hour tripping over wires here and um, trying to keep you guys awake despite it being the last session before lunch uh, by talking about how you can make your data centers more quieter uh, by using no squeal databases. So no squealing. Um, actually, the, uh, the space of NoSQL started out a, a while ago and was hugely revolutionary because uh, at that time, who would not use a relational database for everything? I mean, I've used relational databases for storing encryption tables. Um, we've come a long way since then um, and they're not, it's not as strange as it used to be um, to, to use a non-relational database. But I still believe there's, there might be some confusion left on who's who and what's what and what are the different options and how they work and what are the models and what's the difference really and what's the same. And um, really, it's, in a way, it's all the same as, it, as it's always been. Um, in, to, to quote some famous singer somewhere uh, once said, it's all the same, only the names will change. Um, so it's really all the same as it was in the 70s. It's just different vendors, different uh, new buzzwords, uh, a few of the databases had different kind of names to them. Uh, but really the, the ideas have been around for a long while. Um, but still, I believe there might be some confusion. I don't know if this is still funny, uh, for example. It might or if it's still true. Uh, but this was a lot of fun a few years ago. Um, two guys wearing suits and mustaches in the office talking to one another about, so how do I query this new database? Um, it's not a database. It's a, it's a key value store. OK, it's not a database. Still, how do I query it? Well, obviously, you write a distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. Did you just tell me to go fuck myself? <laughs> Believe I did, Bob. Believe I did. And if you don't think it's funny that I put words on this on the screen, at least it's funny that they wear suits and have mustaches, because they both look like um, Joe Armstrong, the guy who, wrote, who created Erlang. And I think that's funny. Um, yeah, and I stole this picture. So I'm going to be, uh, as I said, the things that, these things have been around for a while. Things have changed and, not, and stay the same in various ways um, throughout the history of databases. Um, and actually, the, uh, the categories of NoSQL databases are pretty much the same as when the NoSQL movement started, um, as they are today. But the vendors, of course, are very different, um, or many of them have changed um, since then. And the products have changed quite a bit as well. It's a rapidly evolving um, space. Uh, so I'll be going through that. Um, and it'll take another 55 minutes. So let's start from the beginning. <coughs> there used to be a lot of databases back, way back when. I should have my notes. Um, so non-relational databases is nothing new. In, in fact, many of these databases predate the relational model. Um, for example, as oh, I could have said something about uh, myself at the first slide. I'm, I'm also, while trying to keep you guys awake, I'm going to try to keep myself unbiased because I actually work for one of these vendors. Um, let's see how that goes. Even though one database is obviously superior to all the others, um, I'll, I'll try to, to not say that. Right, so there were lots of different databases back in the day. Um, many of them were uh, tightly integrated with specific um, query language. They all ha or had their own query languages. Uh, I don't know how many of you have used MUMPS, but it's a very interesting query language and old. Um, there was a database called PIC. It was essentially like what we call, um, what we categorize as column databases today. Uh, so those aren't new. 
uh, and it was integrated with, with, with a programming language called BASIC. How many of you used BASIC? I know I have. Um, then lots of them were, of course, integrated with uh, COBOL, because that was the big language. Uh, it's still fairly big, actually. Um, network databases of the day outperformed SQL databases, but, uh, but re the relational model still beat them. And why was this? Well, first of all, uh, because back when this happened, in, in the 1980s, everyone looked the same. Everyone was the same. Everyone looked like this. And where is my hover skateboard? Um, everyone had one job, uh, one salary, and one wife, because uh, women didn't work. And, and everyone was the same. So we had lots and lots of data that was all the same. And we wanted to do queries on lots and lots of similar data. We wanted to do aggregates on those data. We wanted to find out what's the average salary on everyone on payroll, what's the highest, what's the lowest, uh, how much less can we pay them and uh, still, still not be sued and whatnot. So having a database model that uh, was really good at dealing with sets of uniform data was what everyone wanted. And that's where what the table model of a relational database is really good at. And also, uh, even though every database vendor at the time, and, and this was started in the 60s actually, tried to come up with their own um, query language for, for separating the, um, for breaking away from, from their implementation language uh, and allowing you to query the database uh, outside of, um, of, of COBOL from some different language, queried from C, which was a new radical language at the time, for example. Um, SQL was the first successful um, query language for a database. Um, it was clear, uh, it had a well-defined semantics, and so it really was the first one that you could use from, from any programming language it would work the same regardless of way. It was a, a, a single interface uh, between your program and the database. And, it was, uh, and relational databases were the first to, to have that. Uh, so in the, in the 80s, they, they just took over. Although recently, we've had trends moving away from, from this uniformity. Uh, we now have data is more of a, of a mix and less uniform. Data today is uh, largely, um, well, not necessarily unstructured, but, but, but rather semi-structured. So while data has some structure, uh, there might be a few similar items to, um, a few similar properties to all, to all data items, um, they, there are also a lot of, of differences between the, um, uh, between the data items or entities such as you might have four jobs. Um, you might work without getting paid. You might do volunteer work. Um, you might not be married. You might be married to multiple people, even though that's not legal in this country. Um, so data is, is not as uniform as it used to be. And trying to model that in a relational database going to lead to either one of these two weird cases, which are, neither of which are good for, good match for a relational database. The first top one being there, um, one big, very, very wide relational table. I'm sure you've seen this at some point, um, where most of the fields are null. All of them are nullable. And most of them have null values. Or, um, a very small table with the few required values combined with a, um, a table with, which has extra key value additions to, the, uh, to these entities. So, uh, so an extra attribute table, as shown here, extra attribute table. Um, both of these cases uh, lead to slow query performance, um, awkwardness in modeling, um, weird queries, 
and, and just, mm, I wish we could do this better, uh, which is one of the reasons the NoSQL movement happened. Another reason is this. Data is growing exponentially. This is an exponential curve. What exponential means that given a certain fixed time slot, within that fixed time period, we, uh, we create more data than in all of the time preceding that time period. Uh, I don't know what the exact time is. I think it's something like two years currently. So in two years, we create more data than we did throughout all history before those two years. So we need to be able to handle more data now than we, need to, than we needed to handle in the 80s, obviously, because data grows exponentially. Um, so we need databases that can handle more data, because not only are more people storing data, but we're also storing more data in, in each place. We're storing data about more people. We're storing uh, more data about people. Uh, and about other things. We're storing data about data. Um, so we needed databases that can handle larger volumes of data and larger amounts of modifications to data. So larger write load, um, larger read load, and just larger data sets. So that's the other, another trend, trend for why the NoSQL movement happened. Uh, and also, data change changes. Not only is it becoming more and more um, diverge and uh, less structured, but it's also becoming more and more connected over time. I mean, if data started out, the, the first data management systems that we had were simply the file systems. Uh, we could manage files on a file system. Simple, un simple unconnected uh, data elements. Then we had um, so this is a tree structure, slightly more connected. Um, could have been modeled by uh, one of the early uh, network databases, for example, uh, such as Codacil. Uh, could be modeled through hyperlinks, for example. Slightly more connected than a, uh, than a simple, plain, single unit file system. Um, modern database schemas are a lot more connected even. I mean, if you look at the typical schema of, of an enterprise application, you'd be happy if it looked like this. Most often it would be tiny, tiny boxes like this, but filling the whole screen. Um, I've seen a lot of those. Um, or even more connected, social data today, Facebook, it's all about connections. The connections are the things that are important. So data is becoming more and more connected, and that's another trend that made us move away from relational databases, or at least come up with alternatives. Relational databases still have their use cases, but alternatives are viable. So I said I was going to talk about a few different um, of these databases, and let's start with um, let's start with the simple ones, the key value stores, or key value databases. They're named from the obvious fact that they store data as keys and values. <laughs> and there are a few examples of these. Uh, for example, Amazon SimpleDB, um, probably one of the more, um, one of the bigger names today. Memcached is definitely a, um, a widely used one. It wasn't even called a database. Um, Memcached wasn't called a database when um, when it started around. It was called, it was a cache. Um, I mean, it even says cache in the name. Uh, but then the NoSQL movement happened and, and suddenly everyone uh, was allowed to call themselves database even if they didn't persist data. Even this big database company, Oracle, um, launched around a year ago a product called Oracle NoSQL Database, uh, which is actually a key value store, I believe. Uh, Redis is another one of these. So there are a bunch of different names. And, and when I last gave a presentation on this topic, um, this one didn't exist, or it did, but it wasn't the same as it is today. This one didn't exist at all. This one was fairly new and not very popular yet. So as I said, the names have changed. Still, 
category remains. So uh, one way of thinking of a key value store is that, um, and this is what makes them interesting, is that you, it, they scale really well to lots and lots of machines. So data is just a uh, single uh, opaque um, data object, so just blobs of data. The database doesn't really care about what the data is. All it cares about is that you identify it with a key. It's a key and some value. Um, so you can have many machines and it's really easy for the database system to distribute uh, those values uh, and redistribute them across multiple machines. So if I insert some, oops, that's, I didn't have that connected. If I insert some value, it's really easy for the database to figure out, well, you had a key that said Apple, so, I'm, so it's gonna go into the, this bucket, um, and I'm also gonna replicate it with a factor of three, and those three replicas are gonna be these ones. And when I then insert a fish, it's gonna be um, equally easy for, um, for the database to figure out where fish should go. And the database doesn't really care about what the values are, doesn't care about the fact that an apple and a fish are really very different things. All I care about is that I had a key, it was fish, I had a key, it was apple, and it made it somewhere into the database. And when I have, uh, when I come, uh, I come looking for, key, for apples and fishes, um, the database will know where it is. Even if I've changed the number of machines, I've added more machines, taken machines away, uh, changed the topology in other ways, um, it will know where that data should be now uh, and migrated it to that position or know where, um, where it was before and uh, know how to get it for me. And that's because data is really simple. Um, it's just these keys and values. Um, so it can, it can, it can be migrated um, at will. So when would I use one of these? Well, for example, if I have something like, um, like a media sharing or content sharing platform, where I don't, where, where, where I, what I care about is I have these um, binary objects, don't really care about what the content of them is, but I care about being able to upload them quickly, um, have many, many users upload them at the same time because they're cute and have cute filters on them, so people love them. Um, and I want it, so I want it to be fast, handle massive loads, massive load, so I want to be able to, uh, to as my user base grows, I want to be able to just add more machines to it, and we just handle more load. It will scale virtually linearly uh, with the number of machines and the, um, to, to, to the load that I need. So, platforms that do this, um, benefit a lot from, uh, from using key value stores because their data is fairly simple. One step up the ladder of data complexity, we find document databases. And document databases are really um, still data identified by, by a key. And each data element is still uh, one, um, single contained unit. It's just that the database knows more about what's in that unit now. And we have a few examples of these. Uh, one early example that I don't know how popular this is now, but Lotus Notes uh, is actually a document database. And some claim that all document databases are still just Lotus Notes in a different packaging. One of the more popular ones today is MongoDB. Um, and React and Redis are also um, quite popular. Uh, some claim that these two are better than Mongo, uh, but mainly I think Mongo is just getting a lot of shit because they're, um, they're the most popular one at the moment. Couch used to be really popular, but then they changed their names every month and they're probably not even called CouchDB anymore, they're probably cou called MemCouchBase or something. Um, 
and it's largely forgotten, sadly. Because um, they were really early in the NoSQL movement and in introduced a lot, of, um, a lot of the concepts that are still quite, um, quite interesting um, in NoSQL, such as using RESTful interfaces for accessing data. Uh, was uh, largely pioneered by Couch. So document databases store data as ta -da, documents. So we have a document still identified by a key, an ID. So all documents have an ID. Have an ID. Um, most of these databases assign these um, keys for you, but many allow you to um, to assign keys yourself. Some of them have a duplicate model where if you don't assign a key yourself, you'll, one will be assigned for you. It's kind of like a, a Miranda thing. Then, it can, then a document contains simple key value pairs. So I have a first name and a last name in this document. Um, and what's interesting with document databases is that I can also nest documents. So I can have a key value pair in here where the value is another document. Note, however, that this document is completely contained within the top level document. So it's actually, uh, from the database point of view, this is actually one big document. It just happens that the structure of this document is such that it contains a sub document. And I can have uh, multiple other documents in the database and they don't have to be uh, all the same. As I said, uh, one of the trends is that data is less and less uniform. Uh, so while these have, have some keys in common, they don't have to. This is just because my application happens to, um, to create data that always has the first name and last name fields. Uh, but while, while this one owns a clock, this one has an occupation. This guy is apparently unemployed. Um, and the nice thing is that the database will be able to, um, in an ad hoc fashion, query um, the documents that happen to have the same fields. So even if, even if I haven't defined in a schema or anything like that, that there is such a thing as first name, I'll still be able to run queries um, that, um, that ask for a particular first name, and the database will uh, will only consider the records that have, or the, the documents that have first names. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, documents here are completely um, isolated. If I want to um, relate between two different documents, um, I would have to do that on the, on, in my application, on the application level. The database itself doesn't um, doesn't know how to deal with um, relationships between, between entities. So if, if we have a, another, I guess these are persons, another person in, um, in this database still has the same first name, last name, uh, that happens to be in love with, uh, with this person. Um, the database wouldn't know anything about the fact that, that these two um, have some sort of relationship it would just know that, yeah, there's a field here, it has a value, so what? I don't care. Uh, it's in my application, I would, I would make sense of, of that. Which also means that things such as, uh, things that the relational database handle for us, um, such as uh, foreign fields, um, and making sure that I cannot remove this document without, um, while there are uh, relationships to it, the database doesn't care about that. If you remove this document, you, when you traverse that link, you get nothing. 404. It's uh, scaling the same way the internet does. The internet is also um, lots of HTML documents. And that's largely how they talk about it in so sometimes as well, uh, about being web scale. It's one of those cool buzzwords. Building a blogging platform might be um, a use case where I would employ a document database. Why do I pick that example? Why do I spill water all over the place? Those are questions humanity will never know the answer to. No, um, it's because it's so intuitive. Um, 
blog, blog posts are obviously documents. Um, so I will model my post as just a simple document, contains a short value, that is the title, longer, bigger value, that's the text, it doesn't matter, it's just values. It might contain a list of uh, values that I call tags. Um, and I can search for, um, for posts that contain certain tags. And then I would model my comments as, um, as, nested, as a list of nested documents. Um, and I would scale this up to have um, documents representing the actual blogs um, and refer to, to the post in the blogs. So it's simple and nice because the model that I implement in my database uh, reflects the model that I, um, re reflects the domain that I'm modeling. I have a very close relationship between the data I'm, I'm modeling and the, the way I model it. Um, the next category that I'll talk about is the one where, uh, um, where I'll try to be unbiased because this is um, one of the, where I work. Um, so graph databases is, um, is definitely not treating data as single isolated elements anymore. With graph databases, it's all about how um, things are connected to one another. That's the main, um, the most important thing about data in a graph database. In some way, graph databases are even more relational than relational databases. So while um, key value stores and document databases are, are very much non-relational, graph databases can be considered more relational because uh, the relationships are, um, are really first class in a graph database, um, whereas they're inferred by, um, by set operations and joins in, in a relational database. Um, so one example of such a database is uh, Neo4j, which is um, the product of the company I work for. And Neo4j is a graph database. And in a graph database, I model things as nodes and relationships between nodes. So here I have Neo4j as a node, graph database as a node, and Neo4j is a graph database. So I have a relationship um, that's labeled with the label is a between Neo4j and, a, and uh, the graph database node. So I have, again, I have these diverged set of, of uh, nodes where, where this node clearly represents a different kind of thing than this does. And then I have um, relationships between them. We're not alone in this space. Uh, we have a few competitors. We are modestly, I'd say, that we're the leading graph database at the moment. Um, but there are big names in this space, such as Objectivity. They've been around for a long time doing object databases, and they decided, hey, really what we should be focusing on is graph databases. And um, they're creating one of those called Infinite Graph. Um, another one that's been doing graph databases longer than we have uh, is Franz, and they have a product called Allegro Graph. Um, and while, while we have 4J, sort of implying for Java in, in our name, they're stealthily hiding the fact that they're for Lisp. Um, so I guess that's why we don't see much competition from them. Uh, there's also HypergraphDB or, and InfoGrid, um, which are not making much noise at the moment. Um, one thing that I think, one of the competitors that I think is quite interesting is Dex, um, which is a database created at a um, research center, a, a university in Barcelona. I believe it's Barcelona, Spain, somewhere at least. Um, their their re research is quite good. Um, their product packaging, not so much, but, but their research is really solid. Um, so it's an interesting database for sure. Uh, Vertex DB and FlockDB Vertex, have they launched? Have they not launched? I don't know. FlockDB is something created by Twitter. 
Um, and it's a, a very special purpose graph database um, that's p very well tailored for uh, Twitter's use case, uh, the who follows who use case, uh, but doesn't really handle anything else than that. Right, so those are a few vendors. Uh, let's look more at, at the model of a graph database by an example. Uh, now I'll, I'll take this opportunity to, to, uh, to give you some cultural education as well. Um, so Doctor Who is the longest running science fiction series um, ever. So it's about the doctor. What am I doing that makes that sound? Um, the doctor is a time lord from Gallifrey who stole a TARDIS and used it to uh, travel through time and space. So I have relationships from the doctor to the planet he's from and the object he stole. Um, he doesn't travel alone. In fact, he travels with companions. Um, one or more companions um, at any given time. And these companions have relationships in between uh, one another as well. Uh, the current two companions uh, are in fact married to one another. Uh, traveling through time and space isn't just um, fun and making friends. The doctor has made a few enemies uh, through his travels as well. Um, so we can, so we've modeled the um, the fictional domain of the um, uh, of the Doctor Who universe in the graph through uh, various nodes and relationships of different types or with different labels. Uh, but we can also overlay this graph with, um, with a different kind of domain. So since this is a science fiction series uh, and the longest running one, in fact, the first uh, actor who played the Doctor is now deceased. Uh, so we've had a number of actors playing the Doctor, and these are just a few of them, throughout history. And so we can model that as well. We, so we can have both the fictional domain being modeled in the same graph as we have the um, as we have the uh, information about the um, the actual TV series um, in the same graph. So we have diff two different overlays um, of different kinds of domains, all modeled in the same data set. And then, of course, we have episodes where, um, for example, the Daleks and Rose Tyler both appeared in the Bad Wolf episode. So did the Doctor in one of the incarnations that isn't here. Uh, and we have, um, what are their names now again? This Doctor and the um, Sultarans and the Cybermen in The Good Man Goes to War. So we have um, characters, uh, appears in episodes, so we still have the fictional ties into the real world. So if I want to use a, data, a graph database for something that isn't um, categorizing um, one of my nerdy uh, obsessions, um, for example, I could create a um, uh, a social database, which really is one of the, it's the most obvious one uh, out of the most popular use cases um, for graph databases. <clears throat> there are other use cases such as, the, the second most obvious I think would be um, network topology management, which we have a lot of customers doing. Uh, but also things such as master data management and uh, risk analysis and such things. So say I would want to, uh, to model a social network between, uh, the, just as an example, I use TV series again. Um, the, um, this is a movie. Um, the, the social graph of the character is by, in, in the matrix. Um, who might, and, and as with popular social um, networks of today, um, people can belong to groups. 
So I have a social graph with two different kinds of relationships, um, friendships and memberships of groups. So two different kinds of nodes. I have people who are blue and uh, in this picture and uh, groups that are purple in this picture. Um, but I can also overlay this with uh, gathering information about the, um, uh, the habits of these people. Uh, for example, their shopping habits and do things such as uh, product recommendation, which we have a few um, companies to do. Um, this company does not use our product, but uh, it's, a good, um, it's a good example of, of uh, product recommendation. If, if they had been using a graph database, I'm sure their recommendations would be better. <laughs> Um, so how do you query one of these things? So you query a graph database by defining patterns um, that you want to, to match in the graph. And you use these patterns for, um, uh, for, traversing, uh, for traversing the graph. So you start from somewhere and then you traverse using a pattern. Um, and this really is the key differentiator between graph databases today and um, the network databases of the um, 60s and 70s. Uh, and in fact, we started out in the same way uh, as they did with, with the purely programmatical interface. Uh, but I think this is where we evolve beyond that by having a, um, a decoupled uh, query language where you can actually query the graph through, through something that's um, in many ways similar to to SQL, but in many ways very different. So you have graph patterns expressed as ASCII art. So we have a node here, A, and the relationship drawn with just, uh, ASCII arrows in between uh, the node B. Then of course you put this in a query. Uh, you start from somewhere, start from A, uh, match from A to B through loves relationships, and you return, um, you return the lovers. And of course, you can do much more um, complex and interesting things, but this is not a talk on graph databases, it's a talk on the NoSQL space in general. So I'll move on to the next type of database. Um, that's one of the big four ca categories in NoSQL, and that's the column-oriented databases. Um, this is one of the most, pop most famous column stores in the world. It's um, in Greece. Stores many columns. I've never seen that many columns stored in one place before. Um, this is hugely different from how a column database works. It's just a really cute picture. And uh, take a good long look at it because Greece's economy is really not doing very well. And uh, the workers who are supposed to keeping this, this thing from, from falling over are on strike, I think it's four out of five days a week now. Um, so um, that's why I put that picture up there because it's still standing, but it might not be for long. So what about the column databases then? Um, so they store data in well, really, they embrace this um, semi-structured nature of data that we have today. Um, by having, um, st still storing data in kind of like the column, the, the um, row column tables that we have in relational databases, um, but having a row be more like a document in document database and have it participate in multiple columns. That's a very naive interpretation of, um, of what a column database does. Uh, and in fact, they are, I believe, one of the most um, complex kind of um, databases in, in the NoSQL space. But man, do they scale. Damn, these are good. Uh, but hard, hard to use, but really good. Um, the big one to first make a big splash was Google's Big Table. 
Um, it's not something that you can pick up and use because it's completely internal at Google, like everything else. Um, what you can use is Cassandra or HBase, which is part of Hadoop. And I believe Hypertable is also um, available for use, uh, although not nearly as popular as Cassandra, which really is the dominant uh, column-oriented database in, um, uh, in the wild. So when would I use uh, a column-oriented database? Like, say that I wanted, uh, that my use case is that I want to handle lots and lots of writes. I have a really high write load uh, for some reason. Maybe someone is writing really short messages all the time. And I need to handle that. And the reason I'm picking this example um, of the microblogging example is because that's the only reason that, that's the only example that Cassandra themselves have been talking about for the past three years at least. So I guess it makes sense. Um, so here I would have, um, so the reason I would pick a column database for this is because even though it's, it requires me to, to denormalize my data somewhat, I still have uh, I get the benefit of having l close to linear uh, write scale and uh, really good write performance. I can um, scale this um, database out to multiple machines, horizontally scale them, and uh, I'll get I'll be able to handle more and more re uh, write load for um, for each machine that I add. Uh, I'll be able to handle the read load as well. But um, I'll not necessarily have my data um, available for read immediately after being written. It might take a few milliseconds before it's actually available for being read. But with a, um, with a messaging service such as uh, this one, that isn't really important. It's, it's, an, it's okay if a message arrives a few seconds after I send it. Finally, what about this big elephant I've been hearing so much about, Hadoop? So Hadoop really is, um, it's, it's lumped in with the uh, NoSQL um, databases, uh, but I wouldn't really call it a database, but it's clearly uh, one of the biggest uh, products um, that's sort of come out of this space. So what it is, is a data processing framework. Um, so Hadoop really integrates with lots of different databases. It really even has integration with, um, with Oracle. Um, so what it does is that it sucks in that data into Hadoop and processes it, uh, most often using uh, MapReduce, which is also, again, made popular by, uh, by Google. And sure, Hadoop has, is re really, Hadoop is a, um, a large ecosystem of things um, where the data processing framework is the main thing, uh, but at the base of it, it's a distributed file system. Um, and it also contains um, things such as HBase, which is uh, an actual database. Um, but really, the main thing where, where Hadoop is, um, is really winning and beating everyone else is, uh, is by, uh, on big data processing. Um, and processing is very different from querying. Um, querying is what you do, or can do, um, on live data. So as a user surfs to my website, I do a query and get the data for that user and serve it up within milliseconds. Processing might take minutes or hours. Uh, it's not something I do live, it's something I do in a data warehouse. And that's where, where Hadoop really, uh, really shines. Um, and it's uh, a space where, where our product, for example, doesn't at all. Uh, we haven't focused on um, um, data warehouse processing at all yet. Uh, we probably will in the future, but uh, we currently um, Hadoop is the big winner there. OK, so what have I talked about? 
actually, I've talked about modeling. I might have hidden it, but the important part of uh, choosing a database, and regardless of which one you choose, is that it's all about modeling. And modeling is the act of simplifying the world enough to be able to reason about it, and to be able to store it and process it. And the important part about uh, modeling is to think about what it is you model. So this might be a good model, it might not be a good model, depending on what it is about the real world that we want to be able to um, store, process, and reason about. So when picking a database, it's important that you pick a database that is good for uh, the kind of model that you want to, uh, the kind of world that you want to model. Um, and it also matches um, the application model. So that the uh, model you have in your application matches the, um, the model that you store in your database. And it's quite possible um, that you have a, a model that doesn't fit one particular database, but where you can fit, but where parts of it fits one, database, one type of database and other parts fit another type of database. And in such cases, I really do recommend just use both. Why not? So again, you have gone through key value databases um, such as Amazon SimpleDB, Oracle NoSQL, Memcache, Redis. Um, and these are really shine where, uh, when the data you store is opaque, such as a big blob of data, uh, like an image. You don't really care about what's in it, you care about it being there. Uh, they scale really well. You add more servers, you handle more load. Document databases um, know slightly more about your data, so you can uh, run more kinds of uh, semantic queries on your uh, data. You can query for um, collections of similar entities and not just get uh, a data entity by key. Examples include Mongo, React, Couch, etc. Data is still structured as um, single um, atomically contained values, um, but they are uh, have more structure, and you can nest them. Then we had the column family databases, where the predominant example was Cassandra. And uh, like the key value uh, databases, they scale really well. They actually scale about the same as, uh, as a key value database, um, but gives you some of the um, structure, uh, not really all of the querying capabilities of a document database, but some of the structure. Um, but at the cost of you having to, um, well, you lose some of those queries and you also have to um, do some denormalization of your data. And also, as I said, graph databases, um, which really shines when um, what you focus on is uh, how data is connected and doing deep traversals from, um, uh, from one point and uh, into your data, such as recommendation algorithms, uh, social, um, social networks, um, friend of a friend, who, oh, well that's really a recommendation algorithm as well. Um, threat analysis, and such things. So complex domains where the um, relationships are the important aspect. But of course, uh, relational databases are still valid for many use cases. Um, they still, well, one good reason is because they've been the predominant database since the 80s. Um, and tooling and ad hoc querying and reporting still better in um, Oracle, MySQL, um, and such databases than in any other uh, kind of database. And of course, if you have a system that works and works really well, you shouldn't change it. Um, 
And sometimes data really is uniform and well structured. Uh, you really do have a payroll system. Uh, so that's a, an obvious use case where you would want to use a, um, a relational database. Just please stop, stop using object relational mappers because they're a monster. Uh, they should have never been invented. Uh, relational databases are really bad at storing objects. Um, unless those objects are lots of objects that don't relate to one another, um, that are all the same. That's what relational databases are good for. But if we look back at these, um, um, these non-relational databases, we can see that they fall into two main ca categories. Um, one being aggregate oriented, and these are the kinds of like MongoDB, uh, the document and uh, key value databases, and even the, um, um, the column databases, in that they focus on uh, aggregate objects. So you have the, um, you can have things nest within one another, but it's all based of one single root, and it's all contained in a single data entity. And on the other hand, we have the graph databases, where, um, where it's not aggregate oriented. It's really more relational than relational databases. So you have entities uh, that relate to one another in an arbitrary way. And this isn't something that I've, um, imagined or dreamt up with or, or decided to, to feed you guys with. It's something that the great uh, observer Martin Fowler um, sort of said, hmm, this looks like this is what's going on. We have aggregate oriented, which fall into three different categories, and we have graph. Um, and he talks about this in his, um, I don't know if this book is out yet. I don't know if, if what I've read is a preview or a final release. Um, but his book, NoSQL Distilled, he's co-author on that one. Uh, also on his blog, he writes about this. And that's about it from me. Um, if you're more interested in graph databases, there is a talk tomorrow um, at about this time of day, so 12.30. Um, in, what's this room, I think? Uh, by my good friend and my CEO, uh, Emil Afrem, and he's also Java 1 Rockstar, so it's probably a good talk. Uh, that's specifically about Neo4j for the enterprise and beyond. And if you're even more interested in that, there's a, we're, we're organizing a conference called Graph Connect here in um, San Francisco uh, about a month from now. Talk to me if you want discount codes. Questions? Yes? Are object-oriented databases in are graph databases an evolution of object-oriented databases? Um, no, I think they're... Um, I wouldn't say the, uh, that, it's the, that it's the other way around either, because graph databases are really an evolution of network, the network model, and that existed way before object-oriented programming. Um, but they're, they are similar, for sure. Um, but an object-oriented database is uh, more tied to a specific object model, uh, quite often tied to a specific object-oriented la language, um, whereas a graph database is just about the, uh, the data entities and how they interrelate. So, nothing, so while an object database has uh, objects and classes and hierarchies, um, a graph database doesn't have those things. Yes. What Facebook uses? What Facebook uses? Um, they built their own thing because um, they were quite early. Um, they existed before the NoSQL movement. They, I believe they initiated the Cassandra project, but then they open sourced and sort of shucked it over the fence when they didn't want to use it anymore. Uh, so Cassandra started at Facebook, but they're not using that. At some point, they were using um, MySQL databases sharded in weird ways. Uh, I don't know if that's the case anymore. Uh, but all of these um, big social networks have pretty much written their own uh, systems, more or less. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn have their own systems. LinkedIn systems have gone through various interesting um, phases in their evolution. Yes. So, uh, is 
the basic concept uh, in these databases that the data is kept in the memory? No, not, not necessarily at all. Um, many of these databases try to keep as much as possible in memory, and um, that is an, uh, another reason for, for why you would want to shard a database and, and put it onto multiple machines, is that you can use the um, memory, the RAM of each machine for, for storing your data in memory. Um, but the, uh, that is not necessary. Uh, not necessarily the main reason behind uh, behind these databases. So they still run on a, on a JVM, is that true, or how, how does that? So uh, Cassandra runs in a JVM, uh, Neo4j runs in a JVM, um, Hadoop and all of those, all of the parts of the Hadoop ecosystem runs in a JVM. Um, Mongo, I believe, is written in C or C++. Um, couch was written in Erlang, hence the guys in the mustache. Uh, what else runs in the JVM? There are a few of them written in JVM. I mean, Java is, Java is a really mature platform. We can build databases in Java now. That's, that's a pretty good testament of, of how far Java's come. Um, uh, but really that's, it's all, that's just an implementation detail. Even if these databases are implemented and run in a JVM, implemented in Java and run in a JVM, um, doesn't mean that you need to run Java in order to use them. Even though I guess most of you guys here would, since you're at this conference. So, I, I guess, uh, sorry, I'm is there anybody else? No one else is. Yeah. So I guess. Uh, so Oracle relational databases. You know, you think of Rack and. So that is still a, a quite a diverge space with the SQL databases. Um, so obviously, uh, you don't connect through a um, through a SQL connection to them. You don't talk SQL to them. Um, most of the document databases you uh, submit, either submit um, JavaScript queries that run in, a, in an isolated JavaScript interpreter uh, in the database, um, or um, they have an HTTP interface where you can, can do simple CRUD operations uh, using they call it RESTful interfaces, but it's really just an HTTP interface. Um, it's close to REST, but not quite. Okay, yes. Uh, very good question. Uh, there is an example on the Neo4j side about an access control basis using REST. Yeah. Uh, the question that I have is, do you know about any organization or company who actually I do. So the question was, um, there are ac uh, examples on the Neo4j website on use on building uh, access control lists in a graph database, and he wondered if there are uh, actual companies who do that in production. And the company where Neo4j was started did exactly that. So that model is taken from from that company. So that was a company that sadly failed two times and went back bankrupt two times before we realized, hey, the key asset here is the the database, let's profit from that. But we were, uh, before Picasa existed, uh, we were the biggest um, picture warehouse, online picture warehouse. Can you give us some, some numbers in terms of uh, how many you know, users and how many people are using the database? It's such a database. Um, I don't have those numbers. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and the, I know that the database was of such a size that the, at least the ACLs were consistently kept in hot cache. Um, and so they were all always kept cached in RAM but with our standard caching policy. Um, the, 
the rest of the data was bigger than what we could fit in RAM, but uh, I don't know the exact sizes, sadly. Um, this was a 16 gig Spark machine, I think, that we ran that on. The, the ACL yeah. kind of thing. Um, so the company is called Neo Technology, and we do not, uh, and the product is called Neo4j, and we do not offer um, a particular um, add on module for, for ACLs. Uh, it's an interesting idea, though. I'll bring it up with them. You had a question. Yeah. About, for example, I may have like a medical ontology, then I may have medical documents and you know lab results, for example, and each of those fit nicely into you know different yep. uh, types of NoSQL databases. Uh, so my question is, uh, if I were to pick you know the right tools for the right need, yeah. then do you uh, are you aware of a good solution which will let me you know marry the data from all those? Uh, uh, Hadoop solution specifically that would, yeah. So, so um, I I know that there are people who successfully uh, marry databases from different of different varieties. Um, I, can I mention these ones by name? Are you say it's a large company that does um, uh, media or, or media production systems um, and web browser plugins? Um, who have a cre creative collaboration platform that successfully uh, stores their, uh, the data about the pictures in a graph and the social data between the users and all that information in a, in a graph database near for j uh, and then store the actual content in a key value store. Um, so, so the data content is in a key value store because it's large data objects uh, and they also store revisions there. Um, and the, um, um, the metadata, so the data about the data, uh, is stored in a graph. And I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty good example of, of what you can do. Um, I've also seen um, successful combinations of relational databases and, um, and graphs. Uh, um, so most of the things I've seen are obviously involving graphs since that's where I work. Um, but so so yeah, it, it it I've seen successful combinations. Um, haven't seen any platforms or frameworks that do it for you yet, though. But I believe, I mean, given given the way things usually evolve, I believe we'll see that within a few years. I don't know who's next. I think it might be you. That you yeah, but, exactly. But a graph database is going the exact they, separate direction. They do, yeah. So does that mean that Neo4j doesn't scale horizontally as well as? Um, at the moment, it means that it doesn't scale writes horizontally. Yes, um, Neo4j scales reads horizontally by replication, uh, but but not writes. Uh, we're working on solving that. Um, it is an MP complete problem. <laughs> uh, but if markets work, I read recently that if market works, P e if markets uh, are efficient, then uh, P is equal to MP. Um, so uh, we'll just see about that. <laughs> yes. Is there any database which has all these hybrid solutions? Right. So is there a single database that has um, sort of all the attributes of, of these databases. Yeah, um, I, I know of um, one database that claims um, that claims that it does, um, and it's a very um, very loud-mouthed Italian guy who works solo on this database called OrientDB. He's mainly competing with graph databases. 
uh, but he has um, document-like and key-value-like and, and SQL uh, interfaces for his database as well. What's the name you said? Uh, OrientDB. Orient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, O-R-I-E-N-T. Yeah. Uh, but beware that it is a single guy working on it. Um, it's a cool project, but it is a single guy. Is there, is there any thought of standardizing the interface like SQL type? Mm -hmm. um, there have been talks about that. Mainly it's, there's been talk like among the document databases to standardize something for documents and among the um, column databases to standardize the query interface for column databases and among the graph databases to standardize there. Um, I don't think there will be a standardization across all databases. Maybe there'll be something on like a connection pool level, level where you will have um, uh, a, a something more generic than, than the SQL connections that you get with uh, relational databases today, uh, where what you get is a connection you can send queries in uh, in the query language for that particular uh, database or database category to it. Kind of like you have, you, when you send SQL queries, you have slightly ver varying dialects today, uh, but they share a common interface. I believe we will get to something that is uh, a bit more generic than that kind of connection interface, uh, where you send queries in quite different query languages over the same kind of connection. Then we will get abstractions on top of that that diverge again, so we'll get kind of this kind of uh, API for it. You've been holding your hand up for a while. Uh, how fast are general queries in a graph database like? General you queries. All persons who have these three uh, relationships to those kind of. Mm. So, um, so the key that I'm going to hook onto there is when you said all all persons that have this yeah. capability. Um, so those are not the sweet spot. Um, the sweet spot is starting from somewhere and, and traversing from there. Um, those kind of scan type of operations are, are less efficient. Um, um, how much different is it? I mean, it's, there's no reason why it wouldn't be as efficient as with a relational database, uh, possibly better. Uh, but at the moment, that is not the case. <laughs> so, so. Uh, I don't have exact numbers. Sorry. <laughs>